Okay, thank you for being back. I'm going to introduce you um, to our next speaker. So Edward Kopp is Associate Curator of Drawings at the Harvard Art Museums in Cambridge, where he is responsible for the drawing collection before 1900. But many of you probably already know him as he was previously a curator in the drawings department here at the John Paul Getty Museum. Edward Kopp earned his doctorate at the Courtauld Institute of Art with a dissertation on Bouchardon as a draftsman, and this dissertation was published earlier this year by Getty Publications with the title The Learned Draftsman, Edmund Bouchardon. Edward Kopp is also a, a co-curator with Anis Dema of the current Bouchardon exhibition at the Getty, and is currently co-organizing um, together with Elizabeth Rudy and Christian Smantek, whom you've heard earlier on, a major loan exhibition on the graphic arts in the age of the, the Enlightenment, which will take place at the Harvard Art Museums in the fall of um, 2019. So, Edward, you promised that you would amuse us with your paper, Bouchardon, Caricature and the Grotesque. So I try to amuse you with a bit of a voice that I have left but if I speak very closely to the microphone, apparently we can manage. So at this stage in the conference, um, I'd like to offer some comic relief, uh, not at my own expense, hopefully, but courtesy of Monsieur Bouchardon himself, by looking at an um, admittedly marginal, albeit fascinating aspect of his output. Throughout his career, the academic sculptor and draftsman produce mostly works connected with high subject matter, such as history, mythology, and allegory. My paper, however, will explore an aspect of his activity that is comparatively light-hearted, namely his interest in caricature and the grotesque. As Kellus noted in his rather agiographic life of Bouchardon, uh, which really presents him as a kind of um, uh, hero of the classicizing cause, um, he nonetheless mentions the fact that, I quote, sometimes Bouchardon spent winter evenings drawing caricatures and uh, amusing things, end quote. Kellus' assertion that this was an occasional practice for Bouchardon seems to be co corroborated by the fact that no more than 25 works of this kind are, are known either as drawings or, more usually, through prints etched by Kellus and others. And unless otherwise stated, the prints that I will show you are um, normally authored by Kellus, I mean etched by Kellus. Comico in their subject matter and all their rendering, Bouchardon's caricatures were effectively of three, three types, charged portraits, grotesque figures, and satirical compositions targeting partic particular individuals or groups. By focusing on this body of images, which has never been studied per se, I hope to reveal a shadowy side of Bouchardon, um, irreverent and transgressive. That is surely a far cry from the more usual view of him and his art, namely serious, highly controlled, classical. So what are we, are we to make of these images? Surely they show that he was not devoid of humor, not as stern as his self-portrait in profile, in red chalk, um, suggests. They hint at his amused, potentially caustic view of his contemporaries, but also suggest that he may have been a little, I say, a little more sociable than previously thought. <laughs> I don't want to build up your expectations too much. I will argue that Bouchardon's caricatures are less trivial and more meaningful than they appear to be, for they raise uh, substantial or consequential aesthetic issues pertaining to the representation of nature, human ph physiognomy, formal exploration and graphic expression. Pure amusement or not, they should be seen as an integral part of his oeuvre with which they relate and which they complement. For one thing, he published some of his caricatures and did so under his own name and, to be sure, discerning collectors such as Jean de Julienne and Pierre-Jean Mariette collected them for what they were, not just as any caricatures, but ostensibly as the products of his mind and hand. They were surely not isolated cultural occurrences that somehow would have emerged out of a vacuum, 
because they effectively fit into an old graphic tradition whereby serious artists, going back to, at least to Leonardo da Vinci and potentially back to antiquity, so artists had been involved with the depiction of grotesque figures. The term caricature is derived from the Italian word caricare, which means to load or to charge. It became generally applied to any graphic likeness where the distinctive bodily imperfections of a person have been exaggerated to comical or satirical effects. The charged portrait in its first theoretical formulations by 17th century Italian writers, such as Giovanni Bellori, Carlo Malvasia, and Filippo Baldinucci, was conceived as a revelation of drawing skill, graphic wit, and formal play in relation to the quick sketches of Annibale Caracci and Gian Lorenzo Bernini. And I'm showing you two examples at the top. And the example at the, at the top is on the left is very interesting, a fairly typical uh, strategy of caricature whereby a uh, um, um, human face is gradually turned into an animal face um, and uh, also in the reverse. There's a, there's a long list of um, major Italian artists, in addition to Caracci and Benini, who indulge in this genre. Domenichino, Guercino, showing, showing you an example on the lower left, Pier Francesco Mola, Salvatore Rosa, and more. Whereas the straightforward rendering of natural defects was seen as being too pedestrian, their witty deformation was valued. Bouchardon likely became interested in caricature through his, I quote, good friend, Pierre Leone Getzi, while he was in Rome. During that time, he and the older Getzi had forged a close relationship. Both men were passionate about music, art, antiquity, and they were part of the same milieu of collectors, connoisseurs, and antiquarians. Getzi, the leading exponent of the charge portrait in 18th century Italy, was a prolific draftsman in that genre as he made thousands of incisive likenesses in pen and ink over the course of his career. And here's a wonderful example in the uh, Metropolitan. Several volumes of such drawings are known, including one at the British Museum and two at the Vatican Library. The Vatican's volumes are entitled Il Mondo Vecchio and Il Mondo Nuovo. They depict a whole gallery of notable figures of Roman society, from clerics to princes, to notable visitors and artists, including Bouchardon himself. On the left, you see Getz's charged portrait of the sculptor who is shown at work on his model of the Sturge bust. Compared to Getz's painted portrait at right, he has literally loaded the, his sitter's traits, making his lips more preeminent, his nose more aquiline, his face generally more massive and less youthful. Even the poor Sturge is not spared he looks disheveled, not particularly happy, and slightly ludicrous as uncut bits of wood come out of the base of the unfinished model. Getz's approach to caricature was unusual in two ways. First, most of his charged portraits were far more worked up than were usually Italian caricatures. His graphic approach was generally more, um, was not generally not economical, but rather labor intensive, as he would reinforce his descriptive line work with extensive hatching to suggest shadows and relief. Also, he tended to add inscriptions, sometimes very lengthy ones, and you see an example here, underneath his drawings, including biographical details about the sitter or sitters, such as name, function, but also the circumstances of Getz's encounter with the sitter. His caricatures always suppose some sort of social relationship with the model. Bouchardon did not adopt Getz's habit of extensively inscribing his drawing, but his manner of making caricatures seems to have been somewhat inspired by the Italian artist's manner. So like Getzi, Bouchardon used the linear technique of pen and ink to draw charges. Again, I'm showing you two etchings. Uh, the drawings are lost. Uh, we're going to see quite a few etchings uh, together. But um, if I had the drawings, I would show them to you with great pleasure. And Bouchardon used the linear technique of pen and ink to draw charges, although he very uh, rarely employed um, that technique uh, in other contexts. And to judge from these two examples, Bouchardon's approach seems quicker but also less binding 
that uh, get sees. The tone is gently amusing, irrespective of class, and one can only presume, without knowing what these two sitters actually look like, that the exaggeration of their facial features was limited. But when we readily see, what we readily see is what the draftsman picked on, the protruding, protruding lower lip of the man at left, who Mariette identified as Maître Grado Limonadier, apparently a prominent member of the corporation of beverage sellers. Besides, Bouchardo noted the double chin of the gentleman at right, identified as Anne Hilarion Duplessis Chatillon, Knight of the Order of Malta. And according to Mariette, he was, I quote, one of the great protectors of the new debutantes at the opera. In other words, he would probably appreciate the company of young women. Dated 1750, the caricature is particularly, that caricature, so the, side, the one on the right, is particularly interesting because it bears not only the credit, Bouchardon Del, in other words, Bouchardon Delineavit, in other words, Bouchardon drew it, but also Vatelet sculpts it, which means that it was etched by the noted amateur printmaker Claude Henri Vatelet, who was probably um, a friend of Bouchardon's. And I'm, I'm saying that based on a, a drawing we have in the show, which is an allegory. Um, almost certainly drawn by Bouchardon, but uh, representing apparently the departure of Vatelet from Rome. Um, and anyway, this, is, this would have to be more substantiated, but there may have been a friendship between them. That's my point. One can is easily imagine how some graphic fun could thus have been shared as part of a social interaction. One served as model, perhaps at his expense, the other as draftsman, and the last one as engraver and the result in print could then be disseminated within a wider circle and appreciated in turn. In this caricature of a violinist, it is tempting to see, as um, Guillaume Scherf did in the catalogue, um, um, to, it's tempting to identify the sitter as Bouchardon's friend, the Italian performer and composer, Francesco Geminiani. On the right is Geminiani's formal portrait by Bouchardon, illustrated here through a superb red chalk manor engraving executed after uh, the drawing, uh, and um, the print is by Jean-Baptiste Lucien. It is sober in its presentation of the sitter and retains a sense of decorum. Geminiani appears self-possessed and elegant. He's shown in profile, all'antica. His face and wig are carefully modulated and defined in the third dimension. In the caricature, by contrast, the violinist de is depicted with quick, sharp, and angular lines. He is shown in lost profile, not as a calmly reflective gentleman, but as a tense performer focused on the act of playing. Note how the tip of his instrument deliber deliberately touches, or in a sense animates, the network of hatched parallel lines in the background, which due to its resemblance, or at least basic resemblance, to a score may be thought to take a on a special expressive force, indeed a musical, musical quality. And here I should say that normally in Bouchardon's drawings, um, the background is really about um, dynamism and relief, but it, it really is a kind of, uh, um, assumes a kind of expressive force for the figure itself. And in this case, there seems to be a kind of uh, almost cartoonish connection between them. Merchants, noblemen, churchmen, Bouchardon spare no social class with his graphic wit. Fascinatingly, the print at left was etched by a non-professional engraver, a certain Justine Duronceret, an actress who became better known as Madame Favard, the wife of Charles Simon Favard, the famous playwright and author of Opéra Comique. So the more one looks at his caricatures, the more the artist seems to have been connected with, or at least um, in contact with, people from very different walks of life. Here I'm showing you um, a Swiss with a modish hairstyle uh, at left, which shows uh, the birth lens profile of a, the caretaker of an hotel particulier, a private mansion in Paris. And he's dressed here apparently above his station as a bewig gentleman with m massive facial features. The double chin, the protruding lip, strikingly resemble Bouchardon's. While exaggerating his own traits in numerous self-deprecation, the artist was mocking the contem contemporary fashion for weird, complicated hairstyles. Humor aside, the image implies that Bouchardon would have found his own appearance ludicrous had he worn such an ungraceful wig. They said, in Cochin's official looking likeness of him 
from 1754, uh, which you see on the right, which might have been captured during an elegant evening at Madame Geoffrin's salon. Bouchardon wears the hairdo called a cadenet, a fairly elaborate coiffure that was well suited for so-called people of quality. Yet Cauchy elsewhere gave a starkly contra contrasting account of the artist's habitual appearance, which apparently could verge on the grotesque. I quote, it seemed to me that he went too far in the way of simplicity, that sometimes he would adopt igno ignoble hairstyles, and quite often he came so close to looking like a pauper that anyone imitating him slavishly could have been subject to unbearable ridicule, end quote. This probably means that Bouchardon wore his own hair in public, which could have been unusual then for someone of his status. In forceful terms, Cochin deemed this supposedly eccentric manifestation of his taste for simplicity unworthy of a gentleman. While showing little regard for such external trappings of gentility as refined hairstyles, fascinatingly, Bouchardon seems to have embodied his own aesthetic and moral ideal of simplicity, and the fact that Cochin compared his appearance to that of a, a pauper um, suggests that he was apparently successful in doing so. Bouchardon's most extreme caricature of an identified person uh, is this rough woodcut executed after Bouchardon drawing by Kellus, depicting uh, a slightly ambiguous subject, Miss, Monsieur or Madame Udo. The owners or owner of the noted Udo publishing house, which was responsible for printing many popular books of the so-called Bibliothèque Bleu in the 18th century, the kind of cheap publications that were sold by um, peddlers on the streets of Paris. Here we see Monsieur Udo, who is apparently cross-dressing as Madame, holding a pamphlet, he's wearing a dress and an un un unbelievably high, scruffy, and hideous wig. The pompous verse below, which must have been composed by Kellus, functions as a humorous, sarcastic homage to the publisher, whose role seems to be de facto relegated to that of a printer. I quote, See in the features before you a printer who is loyal and devoid of ambition. To your peers, Udo, you would serve as an exemplar. A printer must make a good impression." End quote. I should note in passing that Mariette's copy of that print, now at the Bibliothèque Nationale, is actually a very good impression. <laughs> but Bouchardon worked here in a self-consciously crude and rigid manner. The background of the of straight hatched line is flat and thus most unusual for his practice. Such an image has to be understood in the specific context of Kellus's interest in Poissard literature. The word Poissard designated an inhabitant of the popular quarters of Paris, a member of a community with its own argot and traditions. A coarse type of literature that had originated at the end of the 17th century, the Poissard genre staged a whole caste of urban figures in fictional situations, often in a theatrical style. By the 1730s, these writings were mainly playful productions, tossed off by a small Epicurean society of men and letters who gathered under Kellus's ages in the so-called Dîner du bout du banc, literally dinners at the end of the bench, or in so-called parodic academies, such as the Académie des Colperteurs, Academy of Hawkers, by far the most prolific of the group, Kellus published chez Udo numerous short novels and plays under his own name, even when they were not by him. His oeuvre badine complète would run to 12 volumes in total. This caricature is a rare example of Bouchardon's direct visual contribution to Kellus's uh, lowly Poissard interests. So the artist's participation in that merry subculture must have been quite marginal. Apart from recognizable figures, Bouchardon was also interested in types. He must have observed real characters in everyday life to draw these two figures, although he probably didn't care very much about who they were as people. The one at left is a church warden in a ceremonial attire, dutifully performing his functioning function at mass. Like Kellus, Bouchardon was very interested in popular characters, and perhaps the most eloquent proof that of that is the series of the Cries of Paris, which is on view uh, at least um, to the extent that it can, uh, because the drawings are bound, but there are many prints in the exhibition, uh, as well as a wonderful viewer, which uh, is accessible also on the website. 
And the series, so the drawings were drawn in around 1737 uh, and then published as prints in five installments between 37 and 1746. A striking feature of the cries of Paris is the way in which Bouchardon deliberately avoided the realm of caricature. Although caricature was a common, almost natural tendency of the graphic genre of street criers' imagery, in part because certain lowly characters, such as the broom seller on the left, with her brooms propping out like a, like, uh, out of her chair, like a bizarre throne of sword, or the brandy seller on the right, and characters like this could have been easily exploited for their inherent sense of the grotesque. This pair of images of blind beggars show that Bouchardon somehow crossed the line when he made the one on the right. Here, his characters are less dignified. For one thing, they are not firmly anchored to the ground and physically less appealing than in the drawing on the left, and the tone is likely humorous. By contrast, there's no really, there's no humor or derision in the way Bouchardon presents the street criers on the, on the left. On the left is a print by the German printmaker Matthias Österreich, after a lost original by Bouchardon, uh, which was in the collection of Heinrich Count von Brühl, the Prime Minister of Saxony. Österreich had a history of involvement with the genre of caricature. He engraved a number of charged portraits by Getze over the course of his career and helped disseminate the latter's humorous work in the Germanic sphere. Such an image is hard to classify, though. Is it a caricature? Not really, because it's stern. It speaks of hard work and poverty, even though the character seems to be at least partially rooted in the grotesque. The workman is shown wearing a costume that is in tatters, which seems to have been of particular interest to the artist, for he stylized the torn cloth to unusual effect. Here we see Bouchardon explore a type of cruder line that conveys the lowly nature of his subject. On the right is an opening of a Mariette album in the Bibliothèque Nationale, where prints were arranged in a deliberate way that seems particularly revealing. It suggests that Bouchardon and Mariette, for that matter, thought that caricature was not demarcated from other approach to representation, but instead part of an aesthetic continuum that can be thought to range from classicism or let's say uh, classicizing approach to realism to uh, uh, so one would call uh, stylized realism in this case and then you know to a kind of gentle caricature with the two blind beggars and clearly there's the way in which these prints are arranged show a kind of a real sensitivity to the nuances of of these approaches to the depiction of um, popular figures. Now I'd like to turn to a type of caricature that Bouchardon seems to have really liked, uh, namely masquerades and characters from the Commedia dell'arte and the world of carnival. These two works, um, oops. these two works would seem to suggest that Bouchardon had a more lively private life than Cochin would like us to believe. They were manifestly the byproducts of a merry company. They've been traditionally dated to the artist's Italian period based on the inscription on one of them, masquerade at Bouchardon's in Rome, also their, and also their subject matter. Masquerades were indeed regularly organized by the pensionnaires at the French Academy in Rome, usually during carnival, as recorded by artists such as Jean-Baptiste Marie-Pierre, Jean Barbeau, and others. Despite this, there are grounds to suggest that these drawings in fact date from after the artist returned to Paris. A lively sketch that seems to have been drawn on the spot. Um, the drawing on the left, so masquerade with figures from the Comité de l'Arte, bears the date 1738 as part of an old um, 18th century inscription on the cartouche below the drawing. It represents figures from the Comité de l'Arte in profile, crouching at the left, Harlequin is shown pulling the long shirt of Puncinello, who looks back in discontent while Columbine stands at the right. A more controlled drawing, uh, the one on the right, a masquerade with figures dressed in fanciful costumes, may have been part of Julien, the Julien collection. Either the medium was mistakenly recorded by the auctioneer, in which case the drawing um, indeed uh, belonged to Julien, or there existed also a retro version so this tidy ink version was perhaps preparatory for a print. At any rate, that composition was described by Mariette as, I quote, 
masquerade ball which took place on the occasion of a supper at Le Moine's, which I attended, end quote. The Le Moine in question must have been the painter François Le Moine, not the sculptor Jean-Baptiste Le Moine, who, uh, whom Bouchardon really disliked. Other compositions further corroborate Bouchardon's interest in mosque bars and the carnivalesque. On the, on the left, you see Dr. Lantern and company. He features um, another character from the Comedia dell'Arte. The main protagonist is wearing an extraordinary long and weirdly shaped hat. He's surrounded by his unruly retinue. Note how one of his acolytes is mounted backwards on his donkey. Reversal, inversion, are typical characteristics of the carnivalesque, as analyzed by the literary critic uh, Michael Bakhtin in his classic work on Rabelais. Admirably inventive, the drawing on the, uh, the, the work on the right, titled Dr. Musta mounted on one of his ideas, is a pun on the word moustache. Not only does the doctor wear one, but his wonderfully strange hat incorporates the shape of a moustache. Dr. Musta's mount, while it is reminiscent of some of Jacques Callot's wildest imagine, imagine, inventions, it also evokes a piece of decorative art. And when I see that composition, my question to you would be, if you had an idea of your own, what would you write on? In The Naughty Boy from the Porte Saint Antoine, we see a fanciful man coiffed with a tall hat with a rabbit top. The blurring of categories between the human and the animal, the animate and the inanimate, is a long established feature of caricature, and the slippage between genre, the grotesque, and wit is part of an ambiguous dynamic. Now I'd like to turn to Bouchardon's overtly grotesque characters, a type of caricature that featured prominently in his suite de charge, a figure grotesque. And you see the title uh, page at upper right with the letter and uh, the same uh, page without the letter at upper left. Etched by Kellus, the suite of eight prints, which you see here on this opening uh, of, of the Al Mariette album, was then published at an unknown date. And I, I can't imagine that this is um, something that Bouchardon would have published early in his career. Uh, he would have probably waited for his serious uh, series, you know, anatomy and uh, academies and so on, to be published. Um, you know, otherwise he, he might have sort of jeopardized the Syrian seriousness of his reputation. So it was um, etched by Kellus and then published by the engraver and editor Etienne Fessar. The title page uh, features a man with an idiotic smile and closed eyes, the strangest of his facial features is echoed by the uneven shape and his coarse hat, and emphasized by the curvilinear hatching within it. His pose, too, is preposterous, seated directly on the ground with his feet projecting forward under the cloth that he holds up. Bouchardon's foray into a caricature cannot be boiled down to pure amusement. In fact, it should also be understood in connection with the renewed and serious contemporary interest in physiognomy and in the grotesque heads of Leonardo da Vinci in particular. In 1730, Caelus and Mariette um, had published uh, in Paris a recueil de têtes de caractère et de charges dessiné par Leonardo da Vinci, a collection of expressive heads and charged portraits drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. With a lengthy introductory letter on Leonardo da Vinci, Florentine painter by Mariette, and you see the beginning of the letter in the middle, which, which is actually uh, an important uh, uh, piece of the Leonardo literature uh, for art historians. And the recueil was also accompanied by etchings by Kellus after drawings in the Mariette collection that were then believed to be by Leonardo and which eventually have been proved to be um, 16th century copies after Leonardo. But in any case, um, uh, Mariette, Kellus, and I imagine Bouchardon would have access to these drawings, uh, would have believed firmly in that attribution. And I think that publication really deserves to be considered in some detail now because it provides a very specific and, and more serious context for the interpretation of Bouchardon's caricature. For Mariette, Leonardo's drawings of expressive heads of repulsive old men, peasants, and women laughing and grimacing were, I quote, a perfect imitation of nature, end quote, because in his eyes they were 
precise, detailed, and true. I quote, sometimes he charged them in the parts where the ridicule was the most sensible, less as a game than as a way to impress them upon his memory with inalter inalterable characters. The Karachi, and since then several other painters, have done charges of this kind more than out of amusement. Leonardo, whose views were far nobler, aimed at studying the passions. It is a constant truth that there are physiognomies that designate certain vices. A man who is angry, patronizing, stupid, has almost always his character painted on his face. Leonardo was a great physiognomist, and he's said to have, to have left a rather large treatise on this matter." End quote. And I'm showing you um, one of the Chatsworth drawings, which is um, by Leonardo, definitely, which is in the Getty collection. And this is um, an example uh, in my museum of a very high quality copy uh, from the period. So the kind of work that Mariette would have had. So, uh, and many of these works by Leonardo were so uh, popular that they were copied um, already in his time. Here Mariette, in that passage that I just quoted, emphasized the didactic value of Leonardo's physiognomic studies in spite of his possible exaggeration of grotesque forms. And if you allow me another quote, but they're they are, they are really worth it. Um, I quote, he would record on the spot the objects that impressed him the most, and he strongly advised other painters to do so. He would even wish that they would collect noses, mouth, ears, and other similar parts in different forms and different proportions as they are encountered in nature, end quote. What Mariette implies is that the artist's duty is to represent nature in its fullest sense, and it should not be limited to observing beautiful nature, but it should also pay attention to weird, indeed grotesque aspects of nature. And this is something that um, Bouchardon really pursues. I mean, you could argue even in the uh, question statue of uh, uh, Louis XV, there are studies after horses that really incorporate imperfections of, uh, of the animal, which are obviously then edited out for the final uh, work. While others saw mere curiosities, Leonardo saw how passions caused the deterioration of the human face. So the Leonardo heads in the Mayad collection, um, most of which were depicted in profile, were placed in circles. In the way portrait featured on medals, there's no doubt that people like Mariette, Kellus, and Bouchardon would have made a connection with ancient medals, and by extension a connection with the antique. Yet Leonardo's decrepit character were effectively anti-classical. They constituted a kind of inverted ideal, the, reversal, uh, the re reverse of the classical medal, as it were. Like Mariette, Kellus saw in Leonardo a worthy guide for the depiction of physiognomy in a lecture titled On Manner and on the Means to Avoid It, which he gave at the Paris Academy of Painting and Sculpture in 1747. Kellus claimed that Leonardo was, I quote, the first who felt the necessity of studying and of recording the facial features that could be related to the movements that had been the least remarked up until then. And he adds, even antiquity has left us no indication that would suggest this operation, end quote. In 1759, in his lecture on head studies, Kellus would go as far as to reject Lebrun's semiotic enterprise and his rather rigid typology of expression, and I'm just showing you a copy uh, by Kodowiecki after Lebrun on the left. And he, he rejected um, the typology of Lebrun in favor of a return to the visible and its infinite variety as part of the, risk, the search for mimesis, and thus following in Leonardo's footsteps. In the same spirit, Kellus would establish the following year, 1760, a student prize at the Academy for the study of heads and expression. And you have a um, print after a drawing by Cochin uh, commemorating this. Bouchardon had showed early on an interest in physiognomy as part of his academic training. In Rome, for example, he had studied closely the work of Domenichino, a recognized master in the depiction of emotions, and also, as I mentioned earlier, a very good practitioner of caricature. And Bouchardon had not just focused on ideal figures by Domenichino, but also on um, you know, more expressive uh, figures, such as the old woman on the left, a drawing in the Louvre, which was uh, subsequently 
uh, reproduced as the red chalk manor engraving. As a mature, mature artist, Bouchano excelled in the genre of the expressive head and displays this kind of work at the salon. The great subtlety, uh, and I'm showing an example on the right, obviously, the great subtlety of the expressions that he rendered suggests that he was in full agreement with Kelusi's admonition to represent nature in its infinite variety. With this pair representing Jean laughing and Jean crying, uh, Jean qui rit, Jean qui pleure, a, f a popular song, which um, he seems to have um, um, depicted as a, as a pair of images. And um, actually, um, the drawing on the left is in Angers, and then the work on the right is actually a red chalk manor um, engraving. And, and I would argue that um, whereas his earlier caricatures were usually reproduced as etchings uh, with the um, relative lack of visual power that it entailed with the advent of red chalk manor engraving, Bouchardon's caricatures, uh, certainly the ones drawn in red chalk, his medium of predilection, could now be brilliantly produced and uh, disseminated. Most of Bouchardon's caricatures are charged portraits or grotesque figures, but we also know two satirical works by him, and here they are. The title of the caricature at right is La Fontaine de Saint Innocent. It's a pun on the name of the critic Lafont de Saint-Étienne, whom Bouchardon does not attack in his physical uh, integrity, but by creating a scene that ridicules him. An innocent Lafont, um, and a rather youthful one, actually, so we're looking at the work um, on the right. Um, the, uh, an innocent Lafont is studying Jean Goujon's Fontaine des Innocents with a magnifying glass in hand, obli oblivious of the fact that a dog is peeing at his feet. This caricature must have followed the publication of Lafon's Réflexions sur quelques causes de l'état présent de la peinture, um, dated uh, from 46, but published in 1747, which was a severe analysis of the art of his time, which he considered to be decadent, and he deplored the proliferation of the so-called minor genres. Well, that's, these are minor genres in a way. And also made rather cruel comments about the paintings exhibited at the Salon of 1746. Lafont contested the authority of Jean de Métier, so um, essentially um, artists, um, and argued that judgment of artist on artistic matters should be left to the public. The issue of status and authority of the connoisseur as the judgment, the, the one person you know, able to judge on matters of art, which really was the belief of Bouchardon's circle, I mean, Kelus Mariette. Um, that issue is also at play in a caricature at left, which shows a pig on an altar. And it seems to have been a private joke, implying insider knowledge, because if you look at it, you see, you, you see a kind of, uh, uh, you imagine that it might be a, um, like a Pierre Gravé, you know, a kind of ancient gem, or um, anyway, something uh, really kosher in the way of antiquity. But uh, Mariette noted in uh, one of his volumes at the BN that it was, I quote, a pleasantry that Monsieur the Comte de Caelus asked Bouchardon to execute on the idea that several people call antique everything that resembles it. To cheat this class of curieux even more, this modern piece had been buried in a humid soil which those stubborn people did not want to admit." End quote. The composition thus takes aim at those who think and claim they are connoisseurs of the antique, but who are not. To conclude, while the practice of drawing charges was considered a kind of libertinage of the imagination with academic artists, which academic artists would have been expected to consider uh, no more than a distraction, I would like to propose that it meant uh, a little more to Bouchardon and his circle. If caricature allowed Bouchardon to distance, his, to distance inf himself critically from the world and to make everyday life appear less familiar and to see it afresh, it also brought him closer socially to some of his sitters and to those who engrave his drawings. Caricature may thus have been one of the ways in which his haughty and apparently misanthropic um, nature could deal with otherness and could articulate the spectacle of difference to reuse Mark Hallett's expression. It was in some sense a mode of social engagement through graphic means, as well as a form of formal exploration and uh, undoubt undoubtedly a way of relaxing both the hand and the mind of a highly ambitious artist. And just as a last note, I just want to um, um, 
say that I've, I've really uh, tried to begin to explore the comical as well as expressive potential of the grotesque, but I didn't go you know, really into the decorative potential of the grotesque, which Bouchardon absolutely loved and which he extensively used in his drawings, in his sculpture, um, you know, in his fountains and so on. And I'm just uh, finishing with this uh, wonderful mascaron from the uh, Fontaine de Grenelle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edouard. You kept your promise, and you managed to be both amusing and very scholarly. I am now going to introduce our last speaker for this Bouchardon Symposium. Perenstein is a curator at the Drawings and Prints Department at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. She oversees the collection of French drawings, prints, and illustrated books before 1800s. And before she came to the Met, she worked for years as an assistant curator of paintings here at the John Paul Getty Museum. Perrin has organized and contributed to numerous exhibitions and collection catalogues, both at the Met and elsewhere, including 18th century French drawings in New York collections in 1999, French drawings from the British Museums in 2005, Gabrielle de Saint-Aubin in 2007, uh, etching in 18th century France in 2013, and most recently, Fragonard, Drawing Triumphant in 2016. Berin is going to um, make us look at Bouchardon through the eyes of Saint-Aubin. The title of her paper is indeed Activating Public Space, Bouchardon through the eyes of Saint-Aubin. So I want to thank um, organizers for inviting me and also for indulging me in speaking about works of art all made after Bouchardon's death, but I hope you will all agree that this still offers some insight into his work and reception. Okay. So, while contemporary visitors admire sculpture in museum settings, as in the beautiful installation upstairs, sculpture has a different presence in the urban fabric, one that is dimmed and relative, I would assert, as to how it functioned in the 18th century. So the crowds that traverse Paris today, for the most part, pass by with little regard the countless bronze and stone figures that lounge on bridges, support balconies, and stand guard on pedestals. And I indulge here in this slide in a little anthropomorphic projection, comparing them to the rooftop angels in Wim Wenders' film, Wings of Desire, rendered lonely by their invisibility to the residents of Berlin who suffer and toil below. In the Ancien Regime, public sculptures spoke more clearly to their flesh and blood counterparts, and it was this human regard and comprehension that in turn activated their presence. This was true most obviously in the case of religious statues that were the object of veneration, or of representations of monarchs that functioned as stand-ins for the royal presence, but more generally, the legibility of sculpted monuments benefited from a fluency in the language of allegory that was more prevalent then than it is today. The evidence available to us if we wish to see sculpture, public sculpture through 18th century eyes is woefully incomplete. How should we navigate the subjectivity and fragmentary nature of surviving visual representations and written accounts, laudatory and otherwise, not to mention the acts of vandalism and ultimately, in some cases, destruction? To explore this question, this paper will examine depictions of Bouchardon's public monuments and the work of Gabrielle de Saint-Aubin. The central premise is that Saint-Aubin's unusual career renders his work, and especially his views of Paris, uniquely multivalent. In addition to being active as a painter, draftsman, and sculptor, he had a long and overlapping career as a designer of allegory and sculptural ornamentation, 
and in addition seems to have applied himself with great energy to the unofficial task of chronicling the changing architecture and public spaces of Paris, the city he lived in from birth to death. For these reasons, his drawings and prints bring a unique perspective to bear on the meaning, reception, and ultimately activation of Bouchardon's public monuments. It is a subject that we'll first consider more generally and then in more detail in relation to two of Bouchardon's commissions from the city of Paris, the equestrian statue of Louis XV and the Rue de Grenelle fountain. The drawings and prints to be considered were all made after 1762, evidence of the ongoing role of Bouchardon's monuments in Parisian civic life after the death of their maker an afterlife where they continued to communicate to and be commented upon by a broad public. So Saint-Aubin was just 21 years old when the Rue de Grenelle fountain was completed. He hailed from a large family of artisans, designers of embroidery and decorators of porcelain. He was undeniably talented, but also quirky and undisciplined. Bouchardon, on the other hand, was, in 1745, an eminent and well-connected figure, patronized by, by the court and the city, a full member of the Académie Royale. So in short, the, the gulf between their stations was vast. Saint-Aubin's precocious skills as a draftsman and inventor of ornament landed him, at age 23, employment as a professor of figure drawing in Jacques-Francois Blondel's École des Arts, a school for architects that was officially sanctioned by the Academy in 1743. The course taught by Saint-Aubin was described in the school's literature as instruction in, quote, the principles and proportions of the human body, the elements of history required to select appropriate allegories and attributes for princely dwellings, sacred stu structures, country houses, public buildings, fetes, and so on, as well as everything which might inspire freedom of imagination and awaken genius." End quote. Blondel's curriculum made use of his considerable collection of drawings made on site after Parisian monuments and architecture. Students were also taken on guided visits that included not only the major buildings of the capital, but also construction sites of works in progress. Saint-Aubin's affiliation with Blondel extended beyond his teaching responsibilities as he seems to have added lively figural, mythological, and allegorical components to many designs by the architect and others in his orbit. Many of these projects relate to FET design and as such are mainly known through only through surviving drawings and commemorative prints. So on the screen is an example of such a collaboration, this drawing of buildings that are being cleared in the courtyard of the Louvre Palace with figures by Saint-Aubin and architectural elements by his employer's son, Georges Francois Blondel. Art historians have not given sufficient emphasis to this aspect of Saint-Aubin's activity, preferring to focus instead on his failed attempts to win the Grand Prix and gain entree to the Ecole des Eleves Protégés. But as Kim de Beaumont's research has demonstrated, Saint-Aubin's affiliation with Blondel was a major component of his development and livelihood extending before, during, and after that academic phase of his career and had an enduring impact. During the first 10 years of his career, devising art and allegory to effectively broadcast the message of monuments, architecture, and ephemera was his blood, bread and butter. De Beaumont, in her essay for the catalog of the 2007 exhibition on the artist, makes the claim that the, that the novelty in Saint-Aubin's fete illustrations lies in the way they impart, quote, to allegorical, sculptural, and contemporary human figures alike the same liveliness and immediacy, end quote. And moreover, that this vision would remain a hallmark of his art, qualities also remarked upon by Christophe Laribeau in the same catalog. So as a foil to the discussion of Saint-Aubin's depictions of sculpture, 
depictions of sculpture, I show you quickly two famous works, Fragonard's The Swing and Watteau's The Pleasures of Love, where statues, be they real or invented, were employed as a gloss to emphasize or offer commentary on themes of erotic or romantic love. Renderings of stone flesh in oil paint, these sculptures were, these sculptures within painted compositions present themselves to the viewer as iconographic keys to scenes lacking in traditional narrative. But if Watteau and Fragonard's lifelike stone figures luxuriated in imaginary gardens, Saint Aubin's sculptures existed in public spaces recognizable to the residents of Paris. So here is a scene from the Salon of 1757 where a cross-section of the public has come to admire the latest work of the painters, sculptors, and printmakers of the Académie Royale. At the center of the composition, a languid woman sprawls on a tufted bed, seemingly oblivious to her admirers. She, or rather it, is the plaster model for Pierre Mignot's Sleeping Venus, a marble version of which would appear four years later. At left, a young mother directs her child's attention to Falconet's nymph and Lemoine's bust of Louis Cannes, but the rest of the room is in evident thrall to the sleeping beauty in their midst. Here I have the same um, image that um, Edouard just showed you. The subject recalls Caylus's humorous print where the joke similarly hinges on prurient interest masquerading as connoisseurship. In this case, expressed in the form of a man so engrossed in his study of a relief of a female nude that he's unaware of the dog being on his foot. Here you could see the inscription that was cut off on Edwards with the play on, on words. The difference is that in Saint Aubin's dim, theatrically lit space, the distinction between animate and inanimate form is left intentionally murky. We are momentarily unsure if the milky glow emanates from the whiteness of plaster or the presence of a goddess. Though asleep, Saint Aubin's nude appears to have agency, and no one dares approach her with a magnifying glass. It is also worth noting in the context of Saint Aubin's treatment of sculpture and allegory, the broader affection for tales of figural fluidity or transformation in 18th century France. Most famous, of course, is the Greek myth of Pygmalion, the Cypriot sculptor who fell in love with his own carving and was overjoyed when, with the help of Aphrodite, Galatea turns to living flesh under his touch as seen here in a painting by Saint Aubin's master, Francois Boucher. It's a subject that gives Boucher the opportunity to show off his skill by depicting the transformation in progress, as it were, with Galatea still stone from the knees down. The terrifying opposite was the monstrous Medea, whose gaze could turn living men to stone, here in a painting by Jean-Marc Nattier. Fantasy or anxiety, both examples are musings on the potential impermanence of the line between figures animate and inanimate. It is worth recalling too that beyond these tales based specifically around stone flesh transformations, the mutability of the human body was also the pervasive theme of the myths recounted in Ovid's Metamorphosis, one of the most illustrated texts in the 18th century. What sets Saint Aubin apart is that while he shared his contemporaries' obsession with themes of mutability, he threw off the cloak of mythology and transposed his Pygmalion fantasies onto present day Paris. Mythological and allegorical figures were, in his eyes, honorary citizens of his native city, celebrants of its physical beauty and of the enlightenment progress and pursuits it fostered. His repertoire may have had its roots in Cesare Ripa, but along the way they seemed to gain weight and a pulse so that they didn't just elucidate a scene, but could enter it and breathe the same air as the human protagonists. 
So in this small etching dated 1760, for instance, Saint-Aubin celebrates the introduction of La Petite Poste, a letter delivery service for the city of Paris and surrounding villages. The young postal worker valorized in the print pays no heed to the sidewalk ahead, but instead gazes up at Mercury. The messenger of the gods functions not solely as an apt symbol for the service, but seems to literally encourage and guide his modern day incarnation. And here, in an etching from near the end of his life, Saint-Aubin portrays a conference of lawyers in a library. Hovering above this learned gathering, on clouds that are somewhat incongruous indoors, are the allegorical figures representing their profession, justice, truth, and eloquence. The symbolism is conventional. What is unusual is how they share the same physical space. Close and palpable, they are illuminated from below by the very same candles that light up the faces of the lawyers gathered around the table. Having had this brief introduction into some of the ways in which Saint-Aubin chronicled and commented on the rush of advances he witnessed in Enlightenment Paris, we turn back to the subject at hand, the portrayal of Bouchardon's two major contributions to the French capital, the Grenelle Fountain and Louis XV. Judging from the dates of the drawings and prints that survive, it appears that Saint-Aubin engaged first with the equestrian statue attracted as he often was, not to the, just to the monument as a static form, but to the events that took place around it, a habit retained, one assumes, from his early career of designing and commemorating royal fetes and the associated ephemera. The placement and inauguration of Bouchardon's statue were events that spanned months and, and involved impressive feats of engineering as well as highly orchestrated fanfare. Given the importance of the monument and the symbolism of the timing of its inauguration, marking the Peace of Paris and the conclusion of the Seven Years' War, it is not surprising that commentaries, both verbal and visual, would have been produced to spin the narrative. Indeed, the officials of the city of Paris had begun planning years in advance to record its inauguration by commissioning a large canvas from a leading history painter. Jean-Baptiste-Marie Pierre was originally asked, but it was ultimately Joseph-Marie Vienne who produced the work, known today from the surviving oil sketch in the Musée Carnavalet. The composition focused unabashedly on the city councilmen, for it was they, of course, who had commissioned the statue, and it represented both their loyalty to the king and their place in the social order. They fill the foreground as they enact the ritual of circling the statue three times, doffing their hats at each rotation, all the while tossing coins into the crowd. Their horseback forms find a diminutive echo in monochrome atop the pedestal in the background. And while the finished canvas is lost, we can see from the print that adjustments were made between the sketch and the final version, with the heads of the councilmen placed even higher in relation to the statue. The same event was recorded by Gravelo in a drawing engraved by Gabriel's younger brother, Augustin de Saint-Aubin, although in this case the vantage point selected established a near equivalence in scale between the bronze stand in for the monarch and the horseback officials below. After the festivities, Bouchardon's statue and the newly constructed Place Louis XV would also be depicted in conventional topographical views. And here you can see the fence that was later installed around the statue. And a decade after its inauguration, the monument, which had been completed in 1772 with the bronze caryatids and relief plaques, stood in the expanse of Place, calmly facing the entrance to the Tuileries. Saint-Quentin depicts it as a picturesque landmark on the approach to the city center. But the statue's assimilation into the urban fabric was not as tranquil as these views suggest. 
As studies by several scholars have demonstrated, the waning popularity of the king following the unfavorable conclusion of the war found a convenient target in Bouchardon's statue, which became the subject of public scorn and was routinely covered in graffiti. As, as a representation of the king's symbolic body, it was a powerful site of protest and the subject of many satiric verses. And it was no accident that shortly after the statue was toppled and destroyed in 1792, the place was chosen as the setting for the regicide of Louis XVI, who was guillotined in the shadow of the hauntingly vacant pedestal. So despite, or perhaps because of, the battered standing of the king at the time of the statue's dedication, a number of laudatory expressions, both written and visual, were put forward to push a sunny narrative to make the case for the equestrian statue and by extension the monarch of whom it was a symbol. And the four known compositions by Saint-Aubin should be viewed in this light. Not surprisingly, they all enlist the language of allegory to portray the arrival and reception of the sculpture. So here in a design etched by Pierre Chenu, our view of the Place is mediated by the city of Paris, who directs the attention of the River Seine to Boucheron's new statue from a vantage point of where the actual river would flow by the south end of the square. In a wry reference, Saint-Aubin um, yeah, Saint borrowed, as it were, figures from Bouchardon's other major Parisian monument, the Grenelle Fountain, to welcome the newcomer. The oval surround is richly draped in garlands, woven of symbols of the capital's achievements and bounty, and surmounted by the coat of arms of the city of Paris. The celebratory message reflects the fact that the plate was part of a publication by the Abbé de Petiti, a member of the Queen's entourage. Saint-Aubin's most original treatment of the subject was likely executed not as a commission, but on his own initiative. Rare today, it is Saint-Aubin's largest and most ambitious etching. With the instincts of a FET designer, he has chosen the thrilling moment of the sculpture's unveiling as a kind of visual crescendo. The vastness of the square and even the sky above are crowded as figures of flesh, marble, and bronze all share space with allegorical figures born of the artist's imagination in what Guillaume Scherf in the catalog calls a dreamlike vision. It is, in essence, a meta-allegory in which Saint-Aubin's invented allegories swarm around and outnumber the stone and metal allegories that are the ostensible subject of the print with the purpose of amplifying the message of the sculptor. Saint-Aubin chooses, as a vantage point, the western edge of his beloved Tuileries Gardens, using fame and mercury atop their high pedestals to frame the symmetrical scene. In contrast to their Baroque dynamism, Bouchardon's Louis XV is stately and calm. The king wears the garb of a Roman general, but is pacifist and paternal, supported by four royal virtues. He looks up and away from the jubilant celebrations that fill the square with drinking and dancing. As he had with the many spectacles and fetes he depicted during his years with Blondel, Saint-Aubin here ensures the legibility of the message by casting a chorus of otherworldly figures. At lower right, figures of sculpture and architecture flank the female personification of the city of Paris, at lower left, standing before a winged figure, a woman offers a basket of hearts signifying the love of the citizens for their sovereign. And arrayed on the ground between the two groups are bolts of richly decorated fabrics and other items representing the prosperity and productivity of a nation at peace. In the sky above Bouchardon's statue, Saint-Aubin has orchestrated an amazing confluence of ethereal forces and human technical ingenuity. Summoning a team of putti and a swish of rococo drapery to spirit away the elaborate system 
of shafts and cranks and winches and pulleys that had been devised to lower the statue onto its base. With the characteristic fluidity between allegorical and earthbound elements, or what might better be termed an inversion, the tactile implements of manual labor have been hoisted into the clouds, the traditional space of allegory, while allegory is earthbound front and center. Mariette's treatise on the fabrication and installation of the monument contains a number of technical illustrations that feature devices quite similar to those being carried off in Saint Aubin's print. So if you can see these, these pulleys with these hooks on the end, there are two of them with the ropes running through. Very same things are in Mariette's print here in the central shaft. I've not been able to locate the drawing that this print is based on, which Dossier knew. It was a watercolor, so if anyone knows where it is, I'd love to know. But um, I have been able, but I can show you today the slide of this related drawing that has never been illustrated in the literature. It depicts the day four months prior to the official inauguration, February 23rd, when Bouchardon's statue was first brought to the Place. It's in a private collection that's very difficult to access, so please ex um, excuse the poor quality of the photograph. The shafts and cranks that are illustrated in Marriott's publication are here shown being operated by a team of workers dwarfed in scale relative to the bronze horse and rider they laboriously inch forward. These are little human figures here, maybe a little hard to see. Balanced by the horseback figure of Mercury at the right and against the backdrop of Gabrielle's still incomplete facade. The arrival of the equestrian monument is heralded by allegorical figures both in the foreground and in the sky, with the closest representing the city of Paris. And as further evidence that Saint Aubin shared Mariette's interest in the technical details of scientific know-how, he made another study of the statue surrounded by its intricate scaffolding. It appears on a page of sketches, part of an album today in the Louvre. Bouchardon's statue is shown in place, but not yet lowered down onto its base. And in this, in this sketch, Saint Aubin anticipates the unusual frontal view he would return to for his print. So in overlaying images of public celebration with an opulent contingent of allegorical figures and accessories, Saint Aubin seems to have in mind the large fet prints he helped design while collaborating with Blondel in the 1740s and 50s. The blank areas above and below the image suggest that he planned to add a title and perhaps an expl explanatory text or dedication, but there's no evidence that the print was ever completed or marketed. But lest we are tempted to associate this unfinished status with the political climate, the more likely culprit is Saint Aubin's lifelong struggle with the etching technique, despite the fact that his brothers, Charles Germain and Augustin, were both highly proficient printmakers, with an enthusiasm that often outstripped his technical skills and patience, and Gabriel left many projects unfinished. And here are the three known versions of the composition. On the left, the first state, which is extremely light, lightly bitten and pale. On, on the right is what is probably the third state, with considerably more hatching to dark in certain areas, but still, in my opinion, unfinished. And very interesting is the version in the center, which I scanned from Dossier's 1914 catalog, but I've never seen. It is an impression of the print, I believe an intermediary state between the two shown here, which has been extensively reworked in ink and wash. So touched, er, touched proofs of early impressions are common in Saint Aubin's oeuvre. In addition to adding shading and modeling throughout, he has changed passages of the inscriptions on the tall pedestals and used graphite to lay in a caption in the lower margin. As was his habit when he came back and made revisions to a composition, he would re-sign it and add the date of his changes. 
In this case, Dossier read a small date in the shadow of the base of the pedestal on the right as 1767. Thus, the reworking of the plate in anticipation of the third state, on, which is on the right side, would have been done at least four years after he first began work on the plate. So presumably the potential profit to be derived from such a topical print diminished as the years went by. So much more likely to be brought to completion in a timely fashion were Saint-Aubin's collaborations with professional printmakers. On the left is Saint-Aubin's drawing of Bouchardon's sculpture as framed by the arch of Gabrielle's arcade on the north side of the Place. He has intentionally drawn the statue backwards, anticipating the reversal of the printing process. The ambition of the composition is considerably scaled down relative to his own unfinished plate, but still not with both feet in the empirical world. Rather than accept the perspectival fact that the side view does not leave visible the medallion on the front face of the pedestal, Saint-Aubin again interject, interjects his own allegorical figures. A winged figure assisted by Putti has detached the medallion from the base and hoisted it into the air, still attached to its garland like a balloon on a string, and turned it to face us. Since the festivities of the inauguration, a fence has been installed around the base, but the veneration of the citizens continues, albeit with a distilled number of onlookers, including two young mothers who direct their children to take in the glory and benevolence of their monarch. In the foreground, a draftsman memorializing the monument, whether intended as a self-portrait or a generic artist, rounds out this microcosm of civic instruction. In the inscription, Saint-Aubin makes note of the fact that the spectator is halfway between the arcade and the pedestal. The perspective, one should know, however, is still quite manipulated as the statue would have appeared, would not have appeared so large from this vantage point. If anyone can read that word, I haven't quite puzzled it out. They could tell me later. But. It is interesting to note, too, that Saint-Aubin invented a facade with tall windows to use as a backdrop. And here I compare to Gravelot's image, which emphasizes the isolation of the monument. The second public monument by Bouchardon, depicted by Saint-Aubin, is the Fountain of the Four Seasons on the Rue de Grenelle. Although it's less prominently situated than the Louis Cannes, and utilitarian in function, it was nonetheless considered one of the city's noteworthy features, as indicated here by its inclusion in Hubert Robert's 1788 painting, The Monuments of Paris. You could see it's visible in the right behind the background behind the Medici column. So commissioned by the city of Paris in 1739 to mark the improvements in the public water supply to the Faubourg Saint-Germain, the project was expanded at Bouchardon's request to include two semicircular wings. As noted earlier, Saint-Aubin was 21 when the fountain was completed in 1745. And two years later, he would be recorded as an instructor in the recently established school of Jacques-Francois Blondel, a theorist and professor of architecture who was one of the more outspoken critics of Bouchardon's fountain. In addition to his written criticism, which spanned a number of years, Blondel also designed public fountains that can be read as implicit critiques of the Grinnell fountain, including this fountain of Neptune, which you see on the right, a model of which was in the collection of Jean de Julien. And the entry in Jean de Julien's sale catalog credited the figural component of the design to Saint-Aubin, a fact confirmed by the artist's etching of the central group seen here on the right. And here next to an enlarged detail from Blondel's design. But even if Saint-Aubin collaborated with Blondel in producing fountain designs during this period, there's no evidence that he shared his mentor's harsh opinion of the Grinnell fountain. 
Saint Aubin's drawings of Boucharon's fountain date from the last decade of his life, a period when he, has re when he had returned to his practice, acquired during his years with Blondel, of roaming the streets, sketching materials in hand to record the city's major monuments. And as part of this preoccupation, he began in 1770 to annotate and illustrate his personal copy of Pigagnol's De la Force's Description de Paris, an eight-volume guidebook published in 1742, where he took particular note of changes and additions made in the intervening years. It was during these last years, Saint-Aubin also made larger colored views of major sites, perhaps intending to engrave them. Two on the screen here depict the Grinnell Fountain. Outweighing, one assumes, his memory of Blondel's criticism would have been his more recent exposure to the collection of Bouchardon's great admirer and friend, Pierre-Jean Mariette, who owned many Songin studies for elements of the fountain. So Saint Aubin's sketches after Bouchardon's drawings fill the margins of his copy of Mariette's sale catalog. And that Saint Aubin's project was distinct from Blondel's is abundantly clear in these two watercolors. Not the flat, objective rendering of an architect. Saint Aubin's oblique and partial views evoke the perspective of a pedestrian coming down the narrow street and gazing up at the larger than life stone allegories. As recognized by Christophe Leribeau in 2007, the Carnivalet sheet depicts a specific civic celebration that took place in late December 1778, celebrating the birth of a royal princess. Indications of the sounds and movements of the festivities fill the lower portion of the composition. Ephemeral structures have been constructed abutting the base of the fountain. The platform on the left supports casks of free-flowing wine, while the draped stand on the right plays host to a band of musicians, including several playing stringed instruments. The revelers below drink and dance in a blur of motion. Calmly presiding above in an elegant and uniform pallor that differs from their appearance today, Paris and her rivers symbolize the benevolence of the state, the carved water from their urns seemingly transforming into wine as they provide sustenance and prosperity for their citizens. The sheet in Stockholm, by contrast, depicts a typical day on the Rue de Grenelle. Focused, as always, on the figural ornament, Saint Aubin makes Bouchardon statues appear larger and livelier than they do in reality. The temporary fet structures are gone, Instead of raucous drunkenness, we have here a scene of urban tranquility. A solitary woman fills her pails from one of the bronze masks, oblivious to the watery symbolism above. But even if she takes for granted her daily task, Saint Aubin directs the viewer's eye to the unseen stone allegories which tower overhead, and above them to the initials L for Louis, carved just below the pediment. The subject for him, as it was for Bouchardon, is the beneficence of the city, and by extension the state, undergirding the peace and prosperity of its residents. As with his works depicting the equestrian monument, Saint Aubin shows us public sculpture in a spectrum of guises. In one case, as a symbolic component of a public celebration, and in another, fulfilling its essential function in a more quotidian scene. By creating multiple views of the same monument, Saint Aubin pursues more than empirical observation. He is attuned to the use of allegory, not just as decoration, but as a form of communication, and his works speak to the activation of sculpture by the presence and interaction of human spectators. From his long association with Blondel, Saint Aubin was uncommonly well equipped to read the language of stone and bronze and to observe the way monuments and figural ornament especially articulated the progress and aspirations of Paris during the Enlightenment. He never gained admission to the Academy, 
nor was he patronized by the crown, but Saint Aubin remained throughout his life an unofficial booster of the king, of Paris, and of all manner of scientific and artistic achievement. His drawings and prints featuring Bouchardon's monuments evince an admiration for the sculptor, but also more broadly, give visual expression to the role of public sculpture in 18th century Paris. Saint Aubin both understood and amplified its message, whether by adding supplemental allegory or by portraying the response it engendered. To be clear, the response he portrayed was not reportage. Sometimes partial, sometimes idealized, it was always refracted through his own sensibilities. But what his views lack in empiricism, they gain in insight, for they bear witness to a tenacious patriotism, especially during a period when depictions of the monarch were increasingly contentious sites. Thank you. Thank you very much, Perrin, for this thorough, very thorough paper on Saint-Aubin and Bouchardon. I know we're behind schedule, but I hope you will stay for some questions. So I'm calling the speakers of the afternoon back to the stage. Um, um, I was very happy to, that you discussed the, the caricatures, because it's something we left a little bit aside in our exhibitions, but also because we didn't have many drawings to show and that's what I was wondering about. Do you know what happened to those drawings? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know it for a fact, but I, I would speculate that <clears throat> many were probably done on the fly, on the spot, in a social occasion. And you imagine uh, perhaps a, um, um, you know, a situation where the, the drawing would be given to the printmaker and, and just sort of let go. Um, many of these works were done very quickly, I think. Um, so that, that's my assumption. It's true that the, the Louvre, which has the biggest collection of Bouchardon drawings in the world by very far, uh, has only two. And one of them is in the exhibition here, and the other was in Paris. Uh, but it's true that, um, yeah, he doesn't seem to have kept them, really. Yeah, and also those two drawings are made in ink, which is quite unusual. The, we raised the question of the attribution for these drawings as well. But now we think they're by Bouchardon. So do you think most of the caricatures were done in red chalk or in ink? It's hard um, to tell. I would say, well, based on the red chalk manner engraving that I showed at the end, some at least were done um, in red chalk, but perhaps most, uh, yeah. most were, would have been done in, um, in ink, I, I would say. Okay. Yes. Just a question for Monique. Um, about the um, the different um, the the way in which um, some of the um, figures were, were sh some of the anatomies were shown in a landscape and shown some on a plinth. I mean, does does this have some sort of connection with different conventions of showing antique sculpture? I'm thinking of the Perrier prints in a landscape, and then the 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 ones that were in the the De Rossi. Ma 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 volume, which I think were all on, most of them are on plinths, I think there's that sort of distinction. No, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I was just looking at it in terms of anatomical illustration, but I'll definitely look at that. Okay. Um, about the, um, since you were mentioning the, the anatomy drawings, um, we, we found out while working on the inventory of the Louvre drawings that some of the drawings for the horse uh, were made in Rome. Yes. And uh, I really couldn't really figure out why Bouchardon copied from an anatomy horse book in Rome and then again in Paris, do you have any Well, the ones that he ideas? copied in Rome were, were from um, a later edition mm -hmm. that reversed, as you know, yeah. <laughs> that reversed the images. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking maybe he had access to it in Rome, maybe at the mm -hmm. Academy, 
And then when he got to Paris, perhaps that's when he purchased his own copy of Ruini, which from his inventory states that it was it was Italian, whereas the one in in with the earlier watermarks was from a French edition. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that makes sense. But also it doesn't go in the way it that um, you were asking if maybe it was a project for publication, then... Well, um, it's a learning process. And then you come to the drawings after the Accorche horse and the model. And um, beyond being more finished, they hold so much more anatomical information than is seen in the Ruini woodcut yeah. illustrations. He is not copying, he's not, he's not drawing the model and then just applying the information that you see on the Ruini and the, and the translations. Um, there is so much more information and I, I haven't traced where that's coming from. Okay. So it's, it's also bespeak so much extra effort and, and um, on Bouchardon's part. He was so invested in this project. That's why, um, to me, it, it, it says that he was thinking of an anatomy okay. book. It would be very interesting to find out where this additional information came from. Yes, yes. I, I need to look further. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any questions from our public? No? <laughs> um, Eva, I was very interested by the way you looked at Bouchardon as a draftsman. And uh, it made me think about the time when he was um, in Rome. Um, because you mentioned that he climbed on ladders to look at the back of the horse, at the top of the horse. But he also did that when he was in Rome. Um, he, he climbed on top of scaffoldings and ladders so that he could copy details in churches or on frescoes. So it's been a, post, a posture that he, he adopted mm -hmm. earlier on. Mm. Uh, that's interesting to hear. I didn't know about that. Um, but there were others climbing ladders. Um, <laughs> we have a drawing at the fog of one of the students um, climbing on actually of the, on the pediment of, of, um, of uh, Pantheon and actually attaching his ladder such mm -hmm. that the ladder sticks out, basically can fall any time. Well, he is copying the metopes of this. So <laughs> obviously, there was something. Well, that would be maybe something that, that Bouchardon picked up in Rome. Um, uh, you know, who knows? Still, it's fascinating to me that he would adopt this unbelievably detailed and totalizing, you know, um, view, totalizing perhaps is not a good word because it assumes that he actually thought of putting them together, which I don't think he did. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that, that incredible, um, incredibly inquisitive and detailed account of, of a model, which is puzzling to me. Yes. Um, if anyone else has, mm -hmm. you know, suggestions or alternatives or whatever, I would welcome them. Katie, you seem to. Right. Oh, sorry. But particularly looking at, at the Bouchardon, at the um, um, uh, studies after the children for the bus reliefs. I mean, anybody who has kids knows it's just not possible, yeah. not possible to still a child for more than five seconds, let alone, <laughs> you know, in those kinds of poses. Um, with that, you know, the, there has to be a disconnect at some, in some instances at least, between what the model will do for him and what he records the model as having done. Because I can't, hmm. uh, unless they're dead, <laughs> I cannot. Or, or as the horse, very, apparently very collaborative, right? It was an old horse from, you know, Baron de Thiers to begin with, and then they, they established a rapport, which as we know, anyone who rides horses knows that that's absolutely necessary. But um, it is also possible. In other words, the horse feels 
what you, you know, what's your attitude, yeah. and therefore either, you know, uh, uses your fear or else, in this case, evidently, cooperated. So I feel, this is an interesting observation about the kids. I didn't think about this um, for the fountain, those sketches. Um, with the horse, I think he did pretty much what he wanted to do, uh, but also what was given to him as a view, whereas with the kids, I'm not so sure. You don't think it's possible that they protest too much about the, um, the willingness of the horse? So I'm just saying, you know, oh, I'm we, because of the way in which it's done, we assume that, therefore, that the model is complicit. And I... You don't think I, so? Well, well no, I was not... not I just don't think it's yeah, given. I don't, I, think, I don't think you can just say, you know, that is not peculiar. So you think he invented the views? No, 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 not just, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because, you know, I didn't think through what the horse would and would, I sort of assumed that this is what, what the horse did allow him to do. Uh, we know those, you know, people talked about it in the period, that that's what happened, apparently. And, you know, there is, there is a lot of information about the horse, given how little information we have about Bouchard, no, relatively. But in any case, for me, um, what was important is what would he, I mean, I, I'm assuming they were taken um, uh, from the horse and what he was willing to do with this, the places he was willing to put himself, which I really still don't understand. Why would he do that? Why would he need to see all these details repeatedly? Okay, one genital, okay, but six? You know, how is this relevant? So obviously there is something he, he, he gets from it, you know. There is something that interests him, he's motivated, he's serious, you know. And there is a purpose in this account. And we have to, I felt that we need to figure out this purpose, right? Um, I'm not, you know, saying that this, would, my argument is the only one one can make, but that definitely presented its, itself to me. Um, so, I think David wants to add something yeah. to it, to well, the horse. I don't know if it helps in any way, <laughs> or it doesn't actually. It's more, it's a question, but it derives from both what Katie says about the disconnect, uh, and Ava, what you had said, particularly about this heightening of learning of the contour, I can do it and I perform it, and the hatching as well, mm -hmm. the kind of finished drawing. And it's, then it becomes a question for Edward as well. So, I haven't seen the exhibition here. I saw it in Paris. There were very few drawings on the wall that are sketches. I mean, these are not done quickly. So where are they? Or did they exist? Or, you know, what is the role of presumably, you know, yes, there are however many drawings after the Cupid or after the horse, but surely there are many more that are the intermediary between, or not. But I, I, it, it's odd to me that there's nothing, or does he dispose of them, or? Um, I think he, <clears throat> He generally drew to a high degree of finish. They are sketches, but they are, I would say, fewer than mm -hmm. for other artists. But often, in finished drawings, you have a very light indication in red chalk, which often you don't see because it's so light, and the finished drawing is so powerful. So I think uh, often he drew on his own sketches. Um, and also I wanted to comment on the issue of children. I think the thinking about this is technique of always, you know, generally starting with the contour, by sketching very quick, uh, very lightly, it could go quite quickly. And then for the relief, there would be a problem if the child had moved, but at least he could get the sort of cut out figure um, on paper. So, hmm. I, I have nothing to add but to he that. Does, he does yeah. the, the, like the Philadelphia drawing with the composition. I forget if what you said in the catalog, but that is done first and then the sheets with the individual, studies of individual babies second? Um, that's a good question. Because um, it, yeah, 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 I think it so. It would because, have to be, I guess, because then he because would. Because the, yeah, yeah. The, the drawings in Philadelphia, yeah. we think, are essentially, uh, yeah, compositional, yeah. like highly finished compositional right. drawings. But then mm -hmm. to move on to the, uh, mm -hmm. the model, then you would need to Replicate draw. Replicate the pose, and, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, the way I see this sort of um, highly intensive uh, investment in drawing is, a, mm -hmm. I would say, simply a way to learn his model like inside out. Mm -hmm. So by the time he, he's at the model level, like for the full plaster, 
he can really correct because he knows the the animal so well. I mean, that, that, that would be one, one way to see. Right, except that that um, I well, a I think there are far too many drawings yeah. than he yeah. needed to yeah. know, yeah. and b they asked from such specific and repeatedly um, of drawing of repeated. Um, details, but from different points of mm -hmm. view, that really don't, does, you know, they don't mm -hmm. change what you would need to right. make of it, yeah. right? Can you have but a hypothesis that, yes. that he starts to veer into an impulse of almost scientific study, that it almost starts to interest him as an uh, as anatomy, that he almost just gets pulled into the study Still, if beyond it is that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if it is that, it may well that be. It's a would be thinking. interesting, yeah. to, um, to me what's interesting, it's what's mm -hmm. really, what what is the logic of that gaze? I guess I was thinking what more impulse than a logic, but yeah. Right. <laughs> well, there is a logic yeah. since there yeah. is so many, yeah. there is such, you know, carp you know, carpuses mm -hmm. of that kind of drawing. So what I'm interested yeah. in is, mm -hmm. is to make sense of that. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously there is no disagreement that mm -hmm. this is a product of a mm -hmm. form of curiosity. Mm -hmm. But the way in which it manifests itself, what interested me was the excess of it and mm -hmm. what to make of it, of that, of that aspect, how to mm -hmm. think through that aspect of an artist's process, which is, to my, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, quite unusual. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, know if anyone knows about, and I'm sure Guilhem knows um, this very well, the process of sculptors in, in the 18th century, whether there is anyone who worked with that degree of commitment to, to drawing in this specific sense, not just to drawing in general, but to drawing for mm -hmm. preparatory purposes. Can you think of anyone who was as exhaustive? No, no, no. no. But this is part of the psychology of Bouchardon himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, uh, his affect to, to drawing and his obsession to that great achievement of, the, of, 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 of a statue. So, Year after year, you know, he, he was so deeply involved with that subject. So, you know, uh, and it, it was, it, it, during 15 years, approximately, mm -hmm. or 13 years, he did only that. It was only that mm -hmm. purpose in his mind. So, and he had, he had a lot to do with the drawing and with the conception, and also to follow all the technical aspects. And um, for, for example, someone says about Cochin um, uh, phrase with, with, with a model with excessive points, and that is a, a key a key point of, mm -hmm. of his psychology. And mm -hmm. we know that for for the bond and uh, the achievement of the la cisure and so on, it was all in that project all was excess excess mm -hmm. of preparation, including with the sculpture, with the sculpture uh, process, with the plaster excess with the drawings and excess with the final um, um, uh, chasing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So because it was it was mm -hmm. so a huge process mm -hmm. in his mind. So I think it is very particular for for him. For him and, but yeah. But also this connects what you are describing connects to what Malcolm was talking about, which is which is a part of sculptor's work that is far longer and takes on you know, it involves taking on all these tasks which the painters don't have to perform. So, in a sense, he's working within the project like a monument and uh, is completely immersed with, uh, with all these for so long, mm -hmm. even if he can do something else. But that project sort of never ends, right? So mm -hmm. there is something about mm -hmm. the sculptor's work. But he, oh, at the same time, you know, Gabriel de saint aubin is, is, uh, is, is catching up with his, um, with his extensive work on etchings, which uh, seem not quite as long as Bouchardon's work, <laughs> but... Um, Way less methodical. It's such opposite working, yeah. working methods. One, he was always rushing and sloppy. Mm. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, so, uh, uh, if I may, uh, yeah. Bouchardon, I think, likes, he wants to be substantial, and he mm. doesn't mind that people talk about the number of drawings made in preparation for the or the question statue in almost uh, you know mythical terms. Uh, I think Kelly says, you know, I can't tell you, I won't tell you how many he made because you wouldn't believe me. Mm -hmm. um, so 
No, for me, he's, he's a very sort of substantial artist who likes to, in the same way, when he goes to Rome and makes so many more copies than, than most. Um, and the drawings have a kind of, um, um, it's a kind of tangible proof that you know, he's gone through the process, mm -hmm. as well as being part of this sort of perfectionism, which is his nature, it seems. So, um, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm afraid we have to, to conclude with his words. I know it's very hard to leave Bouchardon. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for this fascinating symposium. Uh, it's been um, very enjoyable for me, but I hope for all of you. And um, farewell. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks.